and make. And the other question is, do elders have authority to restrict the Bible version used in teaching and preaching, or is this lording it over the flock? So they can start with that, and we can move on from there. I believe that in connection with this first question, uh, I believe the, the order that you put it was, how can uh, a person tell if the elders are simply exercising their God-given authority or if they're lording it over the flock in the decisions that they make? I believe a good eldership would be happy to discuss with any member of the congregation the basis upon which a decision which affects the congregation is made. There should be no difficulty in seeing when the discussion takes place that the elders are uh, doing what they're doing because of their interest in the welfare of the congregation. If it's a good eldership, I would say if an eldership refuses to discuss a decision or thinks that its decisions are above any review, nobody has a right to question their decisions. I'd say there's a problem in that eldership. Certainly an eldership ought to be willing to uh, consider a discussion with any member of the congregation. Uh, you can have the next one. Or that one either. With reference to that first question, I might just might say this. Pin this. I, I agree wholeheartedly and enthusiastically with what Brother Duncan has said. Um, there's a problem. Uh, and when a question comes up and you're trying to decide a matter of judgment and opinion, and we're talking doctrine because the New Testament sets the doctrine, the judgment and opinion. And Brother Duncan, in his speech earlier, I uh, mentioned the time for a service, whether at 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, 3 in the afternoon, uh, the time that the service is going to take place. Um, when an eldership says to the congregation, express your wishes in the matter we'd like to hear what you have to say about it and the congregation gives a feedback and then the elders in their meeting make a decision that decision must be accepted and the decision is final they've looked at it they follow and the danger is this that if somebody in the congregation is of the opinion that the service should be at nine o'clock and the elders determine after deliberation and considering all that has been offered to them on the matter to meet at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The person who says 9 o'clock made that recommendation somehow feels obligated to prove his point and to become a dissenter and to take the, the minority position and then try to get that decision overthrown. Uh, and that becomes a difficulty. And that's one of the reasons, I think, that elders don't want to really throw discussions uh, open uh, because it has, an it has the danger of creating uh, groups within the congregation and each one uh, trying to back his own judgment. So I think maybe what we need to do is spend some time, maybe uh, Mike ought to have a lectureship sometime, on the importance of fellowship and what's involved in fellowship. And maybe the congregation needs to be more thoroughly ins instructed along those lines so that when the elders make a decision, then that is accepted and is not questioned and is not resented, but everybody's enthusiastic about it. I once heard an elder in an elders meeting make this statement. He said, we may sometimes talk to his fellow elders. He said, we may sometimes disagree on a decision that has to be made. I will back my judgment and I will argue my case, but when the decision is made, if it goes against me, I will be as enthusiastic in the support of the decision made by the majority as I was for my original position, which didn't care. Now that's the right attitude and that would solve many a problem if we could have that attitude. Now the second question I'm afraid has to do with um, Versions. Did I hear versions on that? 
How can a person tell if elders are simply no? Okay, uh, do elders have authority to restrict, restrict the Bible version used in teaching and preaching, or is this lording it over the flock? Well, is it a matter of opinion? Is it a matter of judgment? Uh, sometimes the decision on versions is made because there are versions that are not good. Uh, have you ever heard of the cotton patch version of the Bible? How many of you know about the cotton patch version? Some of you have seen that. I've got a copy of the cotton patch version. Well, if an eldership said, we're not going to use the cotton patch version in this congregation, uh, they have every right to make that decision. I think it would be a good decision, and everybody ought to endorse it. For the benefit of those of you who have not seen the, the cotton patch version, uh, there's one statement in it, um, where the writer is talking about Simon Peter and he says in a footnote that his name was Simon Barjona that his name was uh, Peter or a rock and Barjona means son of John or John's son and that his full name was Rock Johnson <laughs> now uh, you, we don't need that kind of nonsense in our Bible classes or in our preaching. And for an eldership to say we're not going to have that is well within their authority. And they should do it. And there may be other translations. We all think of the NIV. If the NIV comes out with the inclusive version that they have considered, von Zondervan considered the inclusive version, and that's a, a gender-free version where you don't use um, a he or her uh, but you use always uh, neuter language. Um, if they come out with that, then that is that is uh, very very bad. And there's been a, a, a groundswell of opposition to that. And I understand that Zondervan has now backed away and said they're not going to come out with an inclusive version. I think that's their most recent decision. Um, but uh, that would be a, a, an extremely dangerous thing. The NIV translation itself has so many weaknesses in it that for an eldership to say, no, we're not going to use that, or as many elderships do, to simply say, we recommend and will allow in our classes in this building and from the pulpit only certain versions, King James, American Standard, uh, maybe the new King James, if they like that, but that for them to state translations that are acceptable and say let's use these translations uh, also is within their authority. And uh, to, to the selection of the songbook, they're going to make that decision. Somebody has to make the decision. And they may make the decision after listening to a number of people and uh, hearing people discuss the strengths and weaknesses of various songbooks and then choose one. But when they make that choice, uh, accept that and, and follow it. Brother Duncan, you have? Yes, sir. I agree with all of that. I want to add this. I believe an eldership not only has the right, but it has the responsibility to see that some reliable version is used by the Bible class teachers and by those who are preaching in the pulpit. Now, I realize that there's not any perfect translation. I understand that. And so I realize there's some room for, for a little leeway there. But I don't believe a congregation's eldership has a right to dictate to the congregation down the block or across town that it has to have the same policy with reference to translations that, that, that the home church does. And so if you don't have the same policy about translations that we do, then you can't be in our fellowship. What translation we use is a matter of judgment. There's some good ones, there's some bad ones. But none of them are perfect, and so it falls within the realm of judgment. But I think an eldership has a responsibility to see to it that in the pulpit and in the Bible classes, the teachers and the preachers use some of the standard translations such as the King James, American Standard, maybe New King James, and uh, some that are, that are considered to be reliable and are not filled with error. Let me put a footnote on that. I, I agree with what Brother Duncan is saying. And there's one uh, further thought. Um, in your private study at home, if you wanted to use some other translation to uh, help you in your study, other than the ones that the elders 
would uh, allow to be used in the regular teaching program of the church, that would be all right too. Uh, and when I look at a verse of scripture and, and study it, uh, I, there are many translations that I look at. Sometimes I look at a, at a dozen different translations. Um, but the four that I always look at are King James, American Standard, uh, New Standard Revised, and the NIV. And those are the ones that I always compare. Um, if there is any any major deviation from the King James and or American Standard, then that gets a very critical going over and a very thorough, in-depth study. But you may use it in your private study where you wouldn't use it in your Bible classes. Who would throw the gift away if Here's the question. Who has the microphone? You can stand. Stand up here. So we... My name is Harold Maxey, and I'm a public building here at Brian. Uh, the statement that you just made, Brother Duncan, uh, I have some average intelligence uh, about what's right and what's wrong. Congratulations. When you say that the elders of this congregation can tell the congregation what version of the Bible that they prefer the congregation to use, but yet don't have the right, and I understand what you're saying, don't have the right to go down to the, the, the another church of Christ down the street and tell them what version of the Bible that they can use. If those versions that the other church is using are contradictory to the ones that are being recommended here, and I realize that that would bring about false doctrine, follows the problem down the road. Uh, what obligation would our elders have in that case? Now, we need to recognize now that I'm not suggesting that if Congregation A down the road teaches false doctrine, that we have no reason or no right to say anything about that. Let's suppose that they use, the preacher down there uses some version that I don't think is a good one. And that does not give me the right to say that's not a sound congregation if indeed he preaches the same thing that I preach and they practice the same thing that I practice. Now that doesn't mean I want to invite him up here to preach in this pulpit, but it means that I don't have a right to dictate policy to a neighboring congregation. First Peter 5, 1, the elders which are among you, I exhort, uh, who also am an elder, and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partake of the glory that should be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. The elders of the Bellevue Church have the responsibility to set policy for the Bellevue Church if it's just a matter of policy, a matter of judgment. My name's Danny Box from Tuscaloosa, Brother Duncan. I need to ask you a question on authority of the eldership. The congregation has a group of people that tries to change some things in the church. The elders... Let me make one additional comment. Hold the mic close to your mouth because it's not coming over the speakers, please. The elders of the congregation, uh, where their folks are trying to uh, make some changes, draw the line. This group of people then say, well, you men have no authority except what we give you. And they leave that congregation because they feel like the elders have no authority to draw the line. What is the elders' responsibility and the congregation's responsibility from where they left? Towards the, towards the group of people that left. Here's a group of people who leave Congregation A and they say that the elders of Congregation A have no authority other than what is given to them by the church. Now there's a sense in which that's true and that's this, that an eldership can't lead where people won't follow. And also in the sense that the congregation selects its elders, those who rule over it. But um, when elders have been duly selected and appointed to the eldership, 
then they have not only the right but the responsibility to oversee the affairs of that congregation. And as I said a while ago, those who will not submit to the elders in matters of judgment are in rebellion against God. Now, I can see where uh, elders might need to be fired. After they've been appointed, they might need to be disappointed if they're not leading the congregation or if they're leading them in the wrong direction. But if people rebel against a duly constituted eldership that's operating in harmony with the will of, with the will of God, then those people need to be marked. The problem is not the The problem was the, the group of people were trying to go along with the change agent. You're aware of the situation up, up home in, uh, in Fayette. And they were trying to make some changes. And uh, the, the, I guess the, you could say the straw that broke the camel's back was they went to the elders and said, y'all have no authority. And they were saying uh, the, the elders have no authority except what the members want the elders to have. And that was the, and then they left, and as you know, established a new congregation. And the the question was the elders, since they would not uh, follow the eldership, the elders and the congregation, congregation A's responsibility would be to do what? Well, I think the congregation's responsibility would be to let the brethren around know that the leaders of this new group were men who were very much influenced by the change movement. And folks, you have a situation here, which I'm finding in a lot of different places. You find churches that split, and 90% of the people who pull out and go with the change movement do not know that their leaders are unsound. They think, well, we're just like these folks. We just had a, a difference in a matter of judgment. But that's happening around over the country. I know for a fact that the leaders of that movement are men who sympathize with Rubuschetti. And I also know for a fact that there are some of the members of that congregation, the group that pulled out, that don't know that, that are good, sound, solid people in their thinking. But they're wrong in thinking that they don't have a responsibility to submit to the eldership. Yes, say something. All primary authority inheres in God, not man. Primary authority belongs to God simply because He is God. His power, His God nature gives Him the totality of primary authority. There's only one other kind of authority, and that's delegated authority. The primary authority that God has may be delegated to men. And men only have delegated authority. They don't have any other kind. He delegates authority to the husband in the home. He delegates authority to the elder in the church. He delegates authority to the magistrate in government. Their authority is delegated authority, not primary authority. The only primary authority is in God, and He alone can delegate. So when these people say the only authority that elders have is the authority we give them, they're wrong. The authority that elders have is the authority that God gave them. And that authority must be respected. Doug McClitchin in Texas. Uh, I tell Buster, first of all, if he'd get the lectureship on time, he'd know we had two great lectures on fellowship already. <laughs> One of them by, was by your compadre, Brother Eddie Whitney. <laughs> uh, the question I have is related to this last question. Uh, from time to time in local work, uh, I've come across situations, uh, sometimes involving my work, sometimes involving the work of others, where brother or sister would uh, misbehave to such a degree that they needed to be marked and withdrawn from, and yet they would leave the congregation just on the eve of being withdrawn from and say, you have no right to withdraw from me, I've already withdrawn from you. Would you address that question, please? Very, very delicate question, and a very cautious answer. Um, if we learned anything from the Collinsville, Oklahoma experience, uh, it is that you must go slowly and and 
uh, proceed only with the with the greatest of wisdom. If a congregation withdraws from some of its members, even though those members just prior to the announcement have said we no longer think of ourselves as members here, that can be noted, state that, and then say a withdrawal was in process and we were ready to make the announcement on this Sunday and so we will continue to make the announcement. Now if any of you, members of the church, have need to know the reasons behind this, the elders will meet with you privately and give the explanation. The danger is when you give when you give the explanation and make the accusations publicly and you have in the assembly people who are not members of the congregation and people who are members of the community, then you run the risk of taking on very serious liability. And uh, the, the, we understand that, that the Collinsville Church came out of that situation up there, but the church lost. The, the people who filed the charges against the church were the winners in that lawsuit. Uh, and some have the impression that it was the church that won. That's not true. The church paid off. And the thinking was, uh, we have this, have this uh, sum of money that has been contributed for the defense of this, and our lawyers are telling us, go ahead and pay the people the agreed upon amount and get the thing settled and don't let it continue in the, in the courts because that's working to the discredit of the church and to the harm of the church and it's uh, far wiser to go ahead and pay it off. But the decision went against the church and so elders need to know that because they can do things that bring a great liability upon the church and can cause the church uh, such financial obligation that it destroys the work. And so there's some, some balance and judgment on that. Do not back away from what the New Testament says with reference to disciplining unruly and disorderly members. Do that and make the announcement public. But don't give the details of it except to those who claim that they have a need to know and who will meet with the elders privately to receive the information. We, we have withdrawn from several people at Adamsville in the last uh, few months and we we haven't had any problem at all in that situation. We did not make any public announcement about the nature of the sin. We made some announcements to the congregation, first of all, that everything has been done that can possibly be done to restore Brother A to faithfulness. But all of our efforts have failed. Some of you may have some influence over Brother A. We're asking you to do what you can to restore him. And then when that didn't work, then when we made the announcement about the withdrawal, we simply said we have been unsuccessful in getting Brother A to be restored to faithfulness to the Lord. Now, uh, we haven't had any problem with anybody coming along and saying, I'm going to sue. Because the church, the congregation has a right to determine uh, what it takes to be faithful. And the law, the law is behind you on that. We, had, we did have one or two who knew they were about to be withdrawn from, and they sent us a letter which said, we are no longer worshiping with you, we're going to be worshiping elsewhere. We made an announcement to our congregation which said to the effect that efforts have been made to restore Brother So-and-So, but we want the congregation here to know that Brother So-and-So has withdrawn his membership and has now chosen to worship at Podunk. And then we let Podunk know about that as well. I'm Wayne Coates, and uh, not long ago, some elders came over and uh, wanted me to write out a statement that they might be able to read to the congregation where there were some unfaithful people. A man had left his wife. A woman had left her husband family. And they were living together. The elders had done everything within their power to try to resolve that situation. And uh, they had visited the couple repeatedly and tried to get them to break up that relationship and live right. 
So I told the elders, I said, I'm going to fill this uh, document or instrument full of whereases and why fours. And they'll think some lawyer has written it. As dumb as they are, they'll think a lawyer's written. And so I began this thing, whereas, so and so and so and so and so and so. And I said, we will put them on the defensive. They had already left that particular congregation. They were gone. There was no fellowship, and you can't withdraw that which does not exist. It can't be done. So they had withdrawn their fellowship uh, with that congregation, and uh, the final thing was to the effect that since we have uh, tried to work with and counsel and teach and instruct and admonish and some, uh, this person and that person, and they have not submitted to our instructions and wisdom decisions on, and have gone out from us, we accede to the fact that they no longer desire our fellowship. And uh, they could not sue. Uh, they were on the defensive. And I think that was the right thing to do in that case. Brother Coach, I heartily agree with that. I wanted to say something about this business of uh, not being able to withdraw from those who have already withdrawn themselves. I think we need to understand Number one, what a serious sin it is when somebody quits the church. And you know that sometimes comes to, you're the fellow who quits the church. We start talking about withdrawing from him. Well, you can't withdraw from him. He's already withdrawn himself. But in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6, where the Bible says, Withdraw from every brother that walketh disorderly. The expression walketh disorderly there is from the Greek word ontokteo, which is a military term. And it means literally to quit the ranks. I don't know of any sin that a fellow could commit that would more, more nearly be described by that word that means to quit the ranks than the sin of just quitting the church. Do you? Now the Bible says we'll withdraw from him. But when a person says you can't withdraw from those who have already withdrawn themselves, I think a second thing he needs to understand is that the withdrawal of fellowship does not take place in the meeting house on Sunday morning. What takes place there is an announcement of the withdrawal of fellowship that brother so-and-so must be withdrawn from. The withdrawal of fellowship takes place on Monday morning when brother so-and-so calls you and says, let's go get our coffee. And you say, I'd love to, but I can't do it now. We've been doing this for years, but we can't do it anymore. Because the church has had to make an announcement of withdrawal from you. And I plead with you, Come back and repent so we can continue to have the kind of fellowship that we've had in the past. But I can't go with you and have coffee with you. That's the withdrawal of fellowship. I actually had a brother in Ed Cash, Texas, to tell me that the next time I catch you down at the church building, I'm going to withdraw from you. <laughs> and I, I don't remember whether I saw to it he didn't catch me. But anyway, <clears throat> that actually took place. I'd like for you, brethren, to discuss, to think about this particular point. When we talk about the withdrawal of fellowship, and the brother says, well, you can't withdraw from me. I'm, I've already left. The question is, uh, he's saying that we do not have any authority over him. But do we not have authority over our own fellowship? And to whom we extend that fellowship? So that if I say to that brother that I have withdrawn my fellowship from you, I have not really taken an action against him. I have taken an action with regard to my fellowship 
and I have taken my fellowship away from that person. So that the action is on the basis of the fellowship that I withdrew, not on the basis of exercising any authority whatsoever on that person. I'd like to have that discussed. I think that's the point that Wayne addressed earlier, and uh, the way he worded that statement was a very excellent way to do that, and I think that uh, Brother Rice is, is uh, simply following up and emphasizing that that is a, that that is a possibility. Uh, where you get into trouble is when you make public statements uh, of accusation against people. This person is an adulterer. This person is a bank robber. This person is a murderer. You're making uh, statements of that kind publicly to the general community to, uh, in a service to which the whole community is invited and to which they all could come. That's when you run some risk. And the risk is that you'll get sued in federal court for slander. Of course, uh, defense against slander is truth. If you can prove your charge, uh, then that's a defense. But um, it puts you to a lot of trouble and to a lot of expense, expense. And then suppose you lose and the federal court says, okay, we think this person is damaged. You pay them $5 million. What would that do to this church? And uh, they can say to you, sell your property. You satisfy that debt as far as you can and close your doors. And, and actually bring, that can happen. And so we're saying you've got to use some judgment with reference to those matters to keep yourself from, from destroying yourself. And uh, it's to, to announce that there's been a withdrawal even after the person has said, I withdraw from you. Uh, to, st to state that he has said that, that this was in process, and that we're going to go ahead and make the announcement. But instead of publicly saying what he did, offer that information for those who have a need to know it in a private environment, and you and you remove. All of the courts will uphold the idea that any institution has the right to protect its own membership and to determine who may and who may not be a member. That's not the question. The question is whether announcements have libeled that person, whether they're libelous. That's the question, and that's a very the delicate legal question that that most of us are not qualified to comment on. In connection with what Brother Rice has said, and I think he's made a very valid point, I agree with what Brother Buster said, but the purpose for withdrawal of fellowship is not one, but several. Number one, of course, to save the offender, 1 Corinthians 5. Number two, to save the church. Paul said, one rotten apple will spoil a whole bear. No, that wasn't what he said. Well, how did he say it? A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. That's the same thing, isn't it? But then the third thing is the reputation of the church is at stake. He said, it's reported that there is fornication among you, commonly reported. Such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. And what's your attitude? You're puffed up. And have not rather more. You see, the church was being looked down upon by the community. They needed to deal with that thing to protect the reputation of the church. Sometimes the reputation of the church is at stake. Uh, uh, just a minute. Dave. Just second purpose for uh, uh, disfellowshipping anyone is to save him. And the purpose of it is to teach him, discipline him, Deliver his soul to Satan if need be, or his flesh to Satan that his soul may be saved in the day of judgment. And your purpose is try to save him. If that's not your purpose, then your disciplinary action is wrong. David Brown, Spring, Texas. Uh, further on what Brother Buster said, I was living in Tulsa at the time of the uh, Collinsville trial. Mary and Gwen bringing suit against them. I attended every bit of the trial. There was never any, they, they would not have had a case if it had not been for the very thing Buster brought out. And the elders themselves said that where we made a sad mistake is that when we absolutely knew that she was guilty of immorality, that we did not go ahead and act. But they went ahead and they would try to catch her where they could visit with her. And I think I've been in some of those situations with the elders. I don't know where... The, I, it's out of a false concept of, of duty to the person and love for the person. 
and you chase them all over town. Well, guess what? The lawyer that she had made them appear to be... He, I remember him saying, they hid in the bushes and watched for her coming out of the washeteria, this poor woman who was just trying to take care of her stuff. They were not wise as serpents. And the Bible demands we be that way, which would include knowing about legal matters and knowing wherein that you can uh, uh, cause problems like this by simply not knowing about these things. The problem was we had, they had never faced an atmosphere in society that would uh, tend to do this kind of thing. I uh, visited with one of the uh, jurors after it was over, and they were would have done all they could far beyond what the law allowed. The atmosphere in Tulsa was such that many members of the church on the job were being questioned. Why, are you, why do you all do this? Because they were able to make their case out very well that we were a bunch of narrow-minded, cultish people that just dominated every breath that a person would make. What you might find rather interesting is that after the judgment came in, they had used the word, and I don't remember where in the trial they used the word adultery or fornication. They used one or the other, and that became, as far as the trial was concerned, that became the term, whichever one it was, that had to be used. Well, the very next week after this was the Tulsa workshop. And they had all three of the elders invited to set up on that stage before all that mass of people bragging on them. And Marvin Phillips got up really crowing about how they took their stand and used the wrong word. Well, the next day after a phone call from her lawyer about liability, he had to stand up before that whole crowd again and apologize for using that word. Some people are slow to learn. There's a couple of other things you might keep in mind at the time what Buster said. It goes back earlier to the matter of when you announce something like this, make sure only members of that congregation are there. And then don't go into a lot of detail. That was said. That needs to be emphasized. Don't put it in the church bulletin. And if you have to let other congregations know, don't write it down. Send somebody over there and talk to the elders privately about it, if that's the case. Seems to me we have just lived in a society so long in these matters that tends to back us up. It doesn't anymore. It's looking for any excuse it can to put everybody on the spot. Thank you for your time. Paul Vaughn, in a mission work we had to disfellowship too. And one thing that the brethren was talking about is the uh, courts coming in taking the assets of the church, depending on what state you're in, whether you're incorporated or not, not only can they take your assets of the church, but they can also take the assets of the individual members of the church. So definitely this is a time for wisdom to be used in, in such uh, cases. So I don't know about the state of Florida, I do know in the state of Kentucky, that if one is uh, not incorporated, uh, then if there is a lawsuit against the, the church, it's in, against the individual members of the congregation, which also ups the ante uh, quite a bit too. So that's something maybe you all know about it. I uh, can explain it more fully than I, but I do know in litigation that uh, they can do that uh, in, certain, uh, in certain states. I know very little about that sort of thing. Yeah. Let me say that didn't happen to us because we handled everything correctly. But I was aware of this because one of the members was an attorney. And, and uh, we incorporated long before that. We also taught on church discipline long before anything had to be done. And I think we need to, uh, it needs to be documented on, in tape. Uh, you need to have articles on church discipline in your bulletins, uh, general articles. And, and things like this, so that in this way someone can say, well, we didn't know what you believed or we didn't know what you taught. But, uh, you know, I do know that in, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that, uh, that if you, they can get in not only to the, to the church, but also to the assets of the individual members in a lawsuit. We must use wisdom in dealing with this. 
I don't know how many we've withdrawn from in the last, I'm going to say the last 18 months, we've probably withdrawn from 8 or 10. I, I've forgotten. I don't believe there's a single one that we have announced to withdraw the fellowship from that would say that we did them wrong. Now the reason for that is because our elders went to them time and time again both in person and by writing letters to them so that they would know exactly what the problem is. And the people who were withdrawn from in every case knew that the elders did what they, had, they, led, they led the congregation doing what they had to do. And I think that's the key to the thing is to let the people know you're doing it because you love them, you're concerned about them. I think there's much wisdom in what this brother said with reference to the liability of individual members. Uh, in state court, it might be pretty difficult for uh, any accuser, any plaintiff, to pierce the corporate veil and bring each individual member under full liability for whatever assets he may have. But bear in mind that slander and libel are federal offenses. That violates a federal law. And when you get it into federal court, now you've got an entirely different ball game. And there, it's entirely possible that every individual's assets could be in danger. So you need to do some careful study on that. We restored some in the efforts that were, we were putting forth that were leading up to their being disfellowshipped. And before we finally made the announcement, they were restored. But up to now, none of those whose names have actually been called and, and uh, it's been said that we're going to withdraw from them, none of them have been restored. Those have actually been withdrawn from them. But some were restored uh, in leading up to the withdrawal of fellowship. Just one comment. One of the things that was brought out in this trial that I kept bringing out over and over again, did you understand that when you became a member of the church that if you did not conduct yourself in a certain way that such an action could be could take place? Well, one way you protect yourself against that is to make sure that everybody that comes when they obey the gospel that they are taught and that they are given material mm -hmm. that does state that uh, what the truth is, I don't know what it might be, you can work whatever out regarding that, but that they would definitely have something given to them that shows you must be faithful to the New Testament teaching or disciplinary action must be carried out. That would be no more than saying what's been said here this afternoon. But that, uh, she could, of course sit there and say, no, I never had anything placed in my hands like that. That didn't help matters either. Let me just say something in relationship to what Gus asked. Uh, I have been in congregations that have withdrawn fellowship, and I do know of situations where after they, an individual had been disfellowshipped, they were restored, and that the action that, that was taken upon them did work uh, to the salvation of that individual. So. We should always know, though, that God's way always works. Appreciate everyone and the attitudes that have been demonstrated. I appreciate Brother Duncan and Brother Dobbs and standing up here before people and answering the questions and getting put on the hot seat a little bit. Uh, the